Father, we just thank you for your feasts. Father, they are holy. They are blessed. And Father, as we enter into the Feast of Trumpets, we choose to hear from heaven today. We choose to hear your word. We choose to hear your voice. Not only in the message, Father, but in the leading of your spirit day in and day out in our lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Father, just let your word be heard today in every area of our lives. The Feast of Trumpets is a time of hearing from heaven and for announcements to be made. And I just want to share with you some things as, as we get started today. I don't have to worry about the CD, which only gives me uh, 70 minutes. I have, we're doing it now on, on video, which gives me 22 hours. So just hold still and I'll just keep going and don't worry if I go a little long, we're going to feed you afterwards anyway. But I just want to share just some of the differences that, uh, that we make. And we have our congregation here. We, we have the Bible College and Seminary. We uh, have the publishing ministry. And I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes I feel like the little boy with the five loaves and the two fishes. And I'm, I'm just amazed at uh, what God has done with what little we have that it, it humbles you. It really humbles you. And I, I just want to throw some things at you. Last year and the last 12 months, uh, we've been able to give partial scholarships $15,000 worth to people that either because th tragedy had happened in their lives or they've lost their job and, and, and just it was hard for them to keep up and that we were able to give partial scholarships. And if you know much about what we do, uh, we, don't, there's only about a, we only charge about 5% over what it really costs us for the students to do these the things with us. And so when we basically write this off, what you do is you trust God for God to make up the difference. And sometimes he does it with uh, people giving gifts. Sometimes he does it by literally multiplying things. I've seen toner last a whole lot longer than it should. Uh, there's been several times last year, I, tr I try to keep track of the books and the stuff that we have on our shelves, and I had down there that there was one left. And so we're going to give something to somebody or somebody does an order. When I go back to the shelf, there are five sitting back there when my record said there were one. We've had things like that happen many times. And, and uh, when God blesses your health and you, you're not sick, how I many know that you don't, if you don't have to pay a doctor, that's money that you can put on other things? And so we've seen God bless in so many different ways. We've got a lot of the... Uh, MP3 and some of the ones that are MP3 and, and video that we, we have here for the church, we try to keep them set back there. Did you know that last year we sent out 1,000 of these free? That we sometimes will, God will say, you know, there's a, we'll have a student come and say, listen, I, I want to take this class. I, I've been believing God for three months and I've been able to get the money together. And God will say, send them this and this and just stick it into the package. Or we'll hear from somebody and God will say, give this to them. And, uh, or we have like this one that has the, the study guide that we have the MP3 in it. Do you know that we started out this time last year with 150 of those sitting on the shelf, and we now just have like maybe six? And just sowing into people's lives. Um, in fact, we gave away almost 500 books last year. This little group with what we're doing and those seating, 500 books that we gave away that for people that maybe they couldn't afford anything and I, we get so much overseas uh, and how many know that they don't have a lot of money over there and so what we do with all our books we also have in PDF so we just simply email them the book. God's so good. Uh, I sent out a report this week and I actually made a mistake on our MP3 downloads. I put that we last year we had 120,000 downloads. That was wrong. We had over half a million downloads of the messages that we post in MP3 only 30% of them are from America. We have people downloading messages all throughout Africa, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, China, Russia, former Soviet Union countries. There's a hunger there. And we have become the church. We've become a source of food for all these people. Uh, we were able to purchase computers last year and to do some wonderful things. 
Uh, we have plans. We're, we're stepping up things. If you notice now, we're beginning to, we're going to start videotaping all the messages, which puts more demand on me. But you know what? God has put in my heart about using, using efficiency and, and multitasking and time management. I'm going to get to do it in ways that I've never dreamed before. But I'd rather be working in the kingdom than just sitting there twiddling my thumbs. And I'm putting you guys, men on notice on some Wednesday nights. If we get behind on some things and need to help with production, we may have a work night instead of a study night. And we're going to roll our sleeves up and go to work because this is kingdom work. We have a lot of things this next year that we would like to do. We've got shelves that we need to restock. We've got some other things that we need to, to get done. And how many know if it wasn't for computerization around here, it, it really wouldn't get all done. And Pastor Rodhouse would tell you that when I get involved on a project, it's just like not watching NASA work. They'll have two or three computers going on and my iPad in the middle. And uh, between Microsoft, Apple, and the cloud, we get everything done. And, I, I just, and I'm not sharing this ever to brag on me, guys. I want you to see what God's doing, that what we're doing right here is affecting the world, but it's doing it kind of under the radar. I think that's so neat. The only complaint that I get a lot of is from our folks in China because YouTube is blocked in China and they can't watch the videos. But I even found this morning that when you go like the last message that I posted on video, you go to our YouTube channel, it says it's been watched 23 times. But that's not the truth because when I go to our blog, just in one day, one of our blogs, we have five blogs, just one, it was watched 100 times in one day. So they only actually count it when you go to the YouTube channel. So there's actually no telling how many there are that are benefiting from these things. And it really humbles me. Just that the graciousness of God, never one of them are led by the Holy Spirit there because we don't do any advertising for it. They're led by the Spirit of God. And uh, I don't know about you, that just causes me to give praise to him all the time. We're dealing today with the Feast of, of Trumpets. And if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to go to Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, 23 through 25, and I, I want to set some foundational things, and some of it I'm not going to cover again because I, I just may mention it because we've already covered it before here in times past, but I, I think that there's a change in the spirit, there's a shifting in the spirit of some things that God is doing, and if, and if, you're, if you're prophetic or you spend a lot of time in prayer, you can sense that maybe you've not been able to put your finger on it. But you can sense that God's up to something. Now, this is out of Leviticus 23. It's dealing with the feasts of the Lord, picking up in verse 23. Then the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Ye shall do no customary work on it, and ye shall, be, and ye shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Now, this is the Feast of Trumpets. Now, on the traditional Jewish calendar, they also have, have blended in with Rosh Hashanah, the, the head of the year. Uh, that is not the head of the year, biblical or any other way. That it actually it comes in the spring. God says it requires the abeved barley harvest and all these things. And we actually find that they pulled that up out of Babylon because that's also the Babylonian New Year. So this is not the head of the year. This is Yom Tura. It is the Feast of Trumpets. And now, according to uh, Rav... Uh, uh, Shaddai, or Sha, um, yeah, these guys can't ever be called Bill or Jim, you know what I mean? <laughs> Rav Shaddai, uh, uh, Gayon, he says there's 10 things that are connected to the Feast of Trumpets and go through the Fall Feast. And the first one I think we did today is called the Coronation of the King. That this is the time of the year in Israel whenever it, it, it coincided with the Feast of Trumpets that if there was ever a new king to reign in Israel, he was coronated this year or at this time. And so there, were, there was a new level of, of praise and worship. In fact, I'm beginning to wonder there for a while if we're going to be able to take up the offering because that worship just kept on going and he didn't want to break it. You know what I mean? And I have the attitude that if God just kept on going, I'm just saying, okay, God, just let me know when you're done because until you're done, I'm not going forward. And, and I love that. We need to make sure that this time of year we make sure that Jesus is king, I am not. I get off the throne, I, I polish off the throne, spit shine it, and I give it to him and say, Lord Jesus, please sit on the throne of my heart. Sit in, sit in the throne of my life. <clears throat> Number two, it's also a call to repentance that between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement is called the Ten Days of Awe. 
which basically means you have 10 days to get it right because when you get to the Day of Atonement, anyone who has not humbled himself before the king is cut off. And you see in the book of Revelation that even during that time, you're going to have angels preaching from heaven. Get right. And the Day of Atonement is a, is a divine rehearsal of the Valley of Armageddon when Jesus comes and he koshers this planet. And anything not right with him and is in league with the, with the devil is taken care of, never to be messed with again. So it's a warning of the impending judgment that approaches, but also it's a celebration of the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai because the Torah cycle restarts this time of year. And so it's a remembering, it's a call back to the Word of God to go back and begin walking in the ways of God. It also uh, is a remembering of the destruction and the future rebuilding of the temple. The rabbis also teach that it was this time of year that Isaac was bound on the altar, that God was going to, uh, Abraham was going to give him to Isaac. It's a hallmark of the, the fear of God. That's re- the Bible says it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom. And guys, right now, there's very little fear of the Lord. Not, I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. There's very little fear of God because we have been doing things our way for so long and getting away with it that we have left the fear of God. It's a reminder of the day of judgment, Yom Kippur. It's also reminding of the ingathering of Israel, which is tabernacles, as well as the resurrection of the dead. Now, some other things that kind of fit in this, which I think is very interesting, is the connection between the 10 days of awe and the wedding feast. In biblical times, weddings were usually held on Wednesday. Maybe that's why sometimes the, 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 the dedicated crowd show up on Wednesdays. Wednesday night services in most churches, it's the, the ones who are really dedicated to do that. Uh, because the bride is given three days to prepare for the coming of the bridegroom. She knows three days ahead of time that he's coming, and so she spends those three days in preparation. And the wedding feast lasts for seven days. So three days of preparation and seven days of celebration, which is ten days. And many of those that understand our Hebraic heritage believe that the Lord is going to come back on Yom Teruah, and that between that and the Valley of Armageddon, which is the Day of Atonement, there's going to be the wedding feast of the Lamb. I'm looking forward to that feast because you don't have to worry about calories. Jenny Craig will have ceased to exist. There's no worry, no worry about how much you eat or how much you celebrate. That's one of the benefits, too, of a glorified body, which I'm really looking forward to. But one of the aspects that I think is so important that ties in uh, to really where I think we are prophetically is called the king is in in the field during the 10 days of awe. And in Israel, it was customary that after the the Feast of Trumpets, and the Feast of Trumpets, some of the terminology Hebraically that goes with that is you'll not know the day nor the hour. That one will be in the field, two will be in the field, one will be taken because you have a Jew and Gentile working together. But when Feast of Trumpet starts, that Jew heads out and he gets his garments, which have been bleached white and pressed, and they're without spot nor wrinkle. All of that's connected to the Feast of Trumpets and the preparation for what's getting ready to come. But the king is out in the field, and so in Israel, whether it was King David or whoever, that he would be out in, in other words, he was accessible, that any citizen could walk up to the king and say, here's my concerns, here are, here are my desires, and you could talk face to face with the king. Could you imagine that? And let's say in, in America that our president would, uh, during the 10 days of all next Tuesday between 5 to 5 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon, the president would be out in the, in the baseball field here in Marshfield ready to talk with any citizen about what was going on and our, in our concerns and our desires for our nation. If you could put that in context. And so in these days when the king is in the field, that means that the king is speaking and I can share with him and there is a spiritual open window that I have during this time that my prayers have a greater impact and that I have an open window to hear from heaven more clearly than ever before if I'll attune myself to the kingdom of God and attune myself. And there are some people that this is the only time of year, they, not knowing their Hebraic heritage, it's like, why in the fall can I hear the Lord so clearly and I struggle the rest of the time of year? Well, you're in the 10 days of awe. 
But this year, it's uh, the king is in the field has a different aspect. And, and to show you what the Lord showed me, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 11. Because how many know that uh, every time the Lord shows up to see what's going on, it isn't always fuzzy puppies and warm rose and pretty roses. There are some times when he comes to visit that it's, you know, have, have you ever, you know, if you've, you've had kids and you've been away for a while, and you've been busy doing something somewhere else in the house and they, 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 get, the, they get a case of the sneakies. They're doing what they should not be doing, and especially when kids are little, a mama knows that if it gets too quiet, it's time to go and to check because they're either trying to burn down the house or, or something's going on. Any, any mama will know what I'm talking about. And so there are, there are times that they need to go visit to straighten things out. Or if there's a big commotion, that means there's a fight. And Jimmy's trying to take Johnny's head off because of something or other that at the moment they even forgot what it was about, but there's this fighting and bickering going on. The first one here is in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, and it said, The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass that as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, and they said to one another, Go to and let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And as they, uh, and they made brick for stone, and slime had they for martyr. And they said, Go to, let us, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered upon, abroad upon the face of the earth. Now notice verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. The Lord came down. The king came down into the field to see the city and the tower. Now, why is this so important? Because this is talking about the Tower of Babel. How many are familiar with a lot of the slogans and stuff for the European Union? That if you go on the website and you look, they, they have actually identified with the Tower of the Babel. Uh, the main parliament building for the EU is a steel and glass structure resembling the Tower of Babel. And I've showed you guys here several times the poster that they have, that they're rebuilding the Tower of Babel. And if you look at the people that are, that are, that are pictured in this uh, cartoon type of thing, they're made into bricks. That it's the will of Babylon, it's the will of the Illuminati, that they're trying to get everybody to conform to their agenda to make them bricks so that they can rebuild the Tower of Babel, not only in martyr and stone, but in people. And what it says is many, many languages but one people. But what I think is interesting, guys, is we're, we're, we're getting to the place in technology. You know that I can go to a site totally in Chinese, in Internet Explorer, or in, or in Foxfire, whatever you use. You can hit a button, and it's instantly translated into English. That they have software now, and our military is beginning to use it, that you can put the piece in your ear. It's a universal translator, just like off Star Trek. You put that little piece in your ear, and if you get him to put the piece in his ear, you both can speak your own language, but what you're hearing in the ear is your own language. It instantly, on the fly, translates. So all this language barrier is, is, is being moved away so that once again the world is saying, we are of one language. And they're trying to build something. And you think that we're all really divided, but we're not. How many know that what seems to be right now in our culture, there, there are some things coming into dominance. The progressive movement is coming into dominance worldwide. That we have socialism. Did you know that most of Europe is social without being a part of communism? Because socialism is a watered-down version of communism. So all of Europe is socialist in nature. Whether they're, they're under... Russia or not, they are socialist in nature, and now everything that we're hearing in America is let's be more like Europe. Socialist, progressive. But I, I, did, I watched a commentator this week that just recently pointed out that when Iran was taken over by radical Islam, that you had the liberal progressives and the socialists worked with them to put radical Islam into power. 
And once they got into power, they took the progressives and, and, the, and, the, and the socialists and they threw them under the bus. It's happening right now in Europe. It's happening right now in America. That earlier this year, there was a conference in Chicago, and, and Chicago seems to be the place that progressivism is kind of flowing from, that they had a conference on the establishment of Sharia law worldwide, of how that Islam is going to take over Europe, it's going to take over America, and that they're looking for the, a global one world government under Sharia law. And we're seeing a kind of a, a, a glimmering of that this week in that we have a Christian pastor in Iran that was never a practicing Muslim. He just had that heritage. He was born in Iran. But his family was never practicing Muslims. He was never a practicing Muslim. But at 18, he made Jesus Christ his Lord and Savior and is a pastor. There, there right now, he is on trial. And if he's found guilty of apostasy according to Islamic law, he will be beheaded for his confession of Jesus Christ. Does anybody ever think that maybe that kind of this sounds just a little bit like the book of Revelation? And so that kind of thing is what they're trying to bring worldwide. And so there's, there's going to be a contrasting that that's the spirit of Babylon is trying for this, this worldwide global thing while well, most of the church is playing hooky because the, the Lord has been so far away from us. In, in other words, when I'm saying that, it's like if I do something my way, heaven doesn't strike me down with lightning. And so I get further and further and further away saying, it, we, we've done it, we've done it, we've done it. The Lord don't care. We can go ahead and build our own kingdoms. We can go ahead and build all these old things. And because there's not instant ramifications, we think we're getting away with it. And we don't realize that's all a part of God's judgment. That's why God allows false prophets. He said, um, I allow pros false prophets to see how much you love me or not. Well, if you love him, you keep on doing what this book right here says, regardless if you see any immediate benefit or any immediate consequence for its violation. How many know that if the, the minute you, you know, as a believer, the minute that you get off the word and start doing pagan things, if lightning struck you, <laughs> the moment that you did it, you really, wouldn't know, you really wouldn't know how many really love God because the proof of you loving God is when you see no benefit except for your love for him. It's not causing money to roll into your coffers. It's, not, you're, it's like you're going through the same thing everybody else is going through, but yet you hold fast to this when everybody's running after the prophets of Baal because they're shaking and moving, and right now it seems like God is doing nothing. You hold fast to truth, what we have forgotten is that is a test. And eventually, the king is going to come in his field, and he's going to come down to see who's building a tower and who's building his kingdom. So God, when, when the king came down, he came to see what they were doing. And how many know that when he showed up, he said, you know what, we got to divide this thing. Because even before Jesus had a chance to come, and give up his life. They were trying to do the book of Revelation in the book of Genesis. God said, we're not going to do this. Let's look at another. We're going to stick in Genesis. Let's go to Genesis 18, verses 20 through 22. Starting with verse 20, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is coming to me, and if not, I know it. I'm going to come down, and I'm going to see what's really going on. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah was not just about homosexuality. Because we, we get the, the whole thing where uh, with Lot, when the, the men w came there and they said, give us the men that came to your house. And we just equate that with homosexuality, but it goes far, far beyond that, guys. They knew they were angels. Because in the occult, having sexual relationship with angelic beings give you supernatural powers. And so it was a practitioner. It was, they were practitioners of the occult looking to expand their spiritual power by having sexual relations with angelic beings. And so that means they were used to having that with fallen 
angels, like we read in Genesis chapter 6. The occult know that. Bill Snublin said that when he got to the place where he was transcending from being just a witch and a warlock to begin walking on the lower echelon uh, of the Illuminati, that he was married to a fallen angel. And that when that was consummated, he said it almost killed him. And so that was going on. He also, there are several other things with Sodom and Gomorrah. See if this is, sounds right. That they had abandoned justice. That their justice was perverted. That if, if, if the poor came in, they would give them money, the rabbis tell us. But they refused any of their people to sell them food so that the man coming in for help would have gold in his hand and starve to death in their streets. You see, God not only judged Sodom and Gomorrah for the sexual sin that was going on, he judged them for the rapid paganism that was going on, the perversion of justice, and for how they treated the poor. How many know that we have a lot of the same things? History is repeating itself. As Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. And God's getting ready to come down to, to see on some things. Now, I'm trying to put two, weave two or three different concepts together because the Apostle Paul warns us in Ephesians about every wind of doctrine, that when the fivefold ministry is not functioning correctly, that everybody's carried about by every wind of doctrine. You know what that means? Your flesh is creating your doctrine instead of the Word of God, that I don't allow this to bring my flesh under control. My flesh starts dictating how I interpret this. That's every wind of doctrine. He also said there's a great falling away coming. But what we never comprehended is you can have a church full of people and they all fell away together. That we have, we have congregations, sometimes mega churches, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people that all fell away together because the remnant left the mess because they could no longer tolerate it. And guys, I get emails all the time from people just thanking God for what we're posting on the internet and some others that are doing the same thing because they quit going to church because they could no longer be a part of that because they saw the falling away that was taking place and they couldn't stomach the hypocrisy and the apostasy that was going on in the congregations. And so they, they left it, and so we, we've never really comprehended just exactly how the falling away is going to be. You can be religious and not be walking with Jesus. Or we, we have one, what used to be a, a queen of daytime talk show, and her name starts with an O, that when they had church and she broadcasted her guru, there was almost a million people gathered worldwide using the technology just for it so they could re-image and reimagine trying to build the Tower of Babel. And now there are many preachers reading his writings as there are pagans reading his writings. And, and with the, well, there are many ways to heaven. No, there's only one. All roads lead to hell except for one. And that one was established by an old rugged cross. And, Je and Jesus forever settled this because if you go to Gethsemane, he said, if there be any other way, if there's another road... If there are other ways to get to heaven, Dad, let's do that. And, and the father said no, and so he had to go to the cross. And if there was not another way found for Jesus, how could we ever think that there's another way to be found? Because if anybody could have ever got his prayer answered, if Jesus said, if there's another way, if the Son of God praying that could not find another way, see law, there isn't another way. Because he said, narrow is the gate and straight is the path that leads to salvation. But broad, a 200-lane highway, superhighway, leads straight to hell. You may feel real good and give him warm fuzzies right before you go over the cliff. Come on. Now, I want to deal with a concept, and I was originally going to bring a watch to kind of represent a pendulum. But then I was afraid that you know how people do stuff on the Internet? Mike Lake is hypnotizing his congregation, so I, didn't, I, didn't, I did not bring it. <laughs> but in Genesis 2, 4, it says, these are the generations of heaven and earth that they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Now, that's the first mention of, of Yahweh Elohim 
in the Word of God. And so when you use the, the principle of first mention, this is highly significant. Now, the rabbis teach that Yahweh represents the grace of God and Elohim represents the severity or the justice or the judgment of God. And so when God created the heavens and the earth, he had to balance grace and justice together. Now, let me give you a neat example because it doesn't mean it's always 50-50. It means it can go all the way to 98% and 2% all the way the other way. It's like a pendulum that goes back and forth. And it will slowly move throughout history. Now, there was a place, one place in history that it was 100% grace and 0% judgment as far as we're concerned. It's called the cross. Because it has to be balanced. Everything has to be balanced. 100% of the justice and judgment of God was poured out on Jesus on the cross so that 100% of his grace could be poured out upon us. And if it wasn't for the cross, we would have had to bear our own load. And so heaven still, if you will come under Jesus and make him the king and the ruler and savior of your life, you still get that 100% and 0% spiritually. But how many know that when I wander away from the cross, that can change? And there are testings because it's not always 50% grace, 50% justice. When you look out through history, that pendulum begins to shift but, but the, what I have found out, we, we have been going, and there have been times where we have seen in history that it was like 40% grace and 60% justice, where God was judging some things in the earth to corral some things, to, to give hope for the remnant. But if it, if it went 60-40 this way, it would eventually have to go back to where it was 60-40 toward grace. Because... Since God fills all time and space, he, for us, it seems like it's not balanced right now, but history will balance it back out because God fills all time as well as space. Now, guys, we have been going through a very long season of probably about 30, 40 years that we have been 90% grace and 10% judgment and justice. That, that has been a benefit, but it has been a test, and it has been a trial because it has gotten a lot of believers frustrated. Do, do you remember places in Scripture that God tells us, don't get jealous when it seems like evil is prospering? It seems like they can get away with anything they want, and there's no real benefit in following after God says, now don't get frustrated with that because you're in this thing where you, you don't realize it's a test. It's not only a test for the world, but believer, it's a test for you. Are you just in this thing because it puts more coin in your pocket? Or are you in this thing because you're, you're like how Martin Luther was when he first surrendered to ministry? It's because he got struck by lightning. Did you know that? Martin Luther got struck by lightning. He was going to be a lawyer, and, his, and it killed his horse. And he got up from there and says, whoa, I think I'll serve God. <laughs> and so how many know that after that, every time there was a thunderstorm, he kind of jerked just a little bit? Because there were, there, were, there, were some, there were some things Martin Luther did really good. There were some things he was really a poop head. I'm serious. There were some of his writings that Hitler used against the Jews. And so there, there, there's some things that when you, you see him being called before the councils, it's like there, there was a fear of God on him. <laughs> and I, I imagine that God in his humor, every time that Martin Luther stood before the council, it, it, there, there's a movie on Martin Luther's life where he says, I cannot do anything but that which I do, kind of and paraphrasing a little bit. It's like he's real bold. History doesn't say that. It's like, guys, I can't do anything but that which I'm doing. And I imagine that if God had any sense of humor, Every time they pulled him before council, there would have been a storm outside. <laughs> Guys, I can't do anything but that which I'm doing. <laughs> Where's a lightning rod? <laughs> if you can imagine that. but So we have times like that. But see, God wants us not to serve him out of fear of catastrophe. It's the reverential fear of God that I so love him and so fear or respect him that I will be true to this word. When, it's, when it shows that, in, like in this life right now, there's no benefit from it, except for just 
the best, the basic blessings that. How many know there's a basic blessing when you're faithful to your wife and your wife is faithful to you and it establishes a household? The blessings of God are there. And there's long term, there's, there's a level of trust that you can't get where, you know, if, if I was a, a skirt chaser, there would be no real trust here. Mary couldn't even trust me to go out in ministry someplace. And we have a lot of preachers right now in the pulpit that way, and they've just duped their wives into thinking, well, this is this kind of the way it is. You've got to live with it. But, you know, there's so much money coming into the ministry, then they can actually stand in the pulpit and say, that's just between me and my wife. No, it's not. But there's no fear of God because lightning isn't striking. That's a test for them as much as it is a test for the remnant. Because we have been swung so far this way that there are no consequences. The prophets of Baal have been prospering. They have been just like in, in Samuel's day, that they're the ones who get the banquet table of the king and the queen while they're having to hide somewhere out in a hole, and ravens have got to come and bring them food while the, while the prophets of Baal are setting feasting at the king's table. But you know what? I would rather be a prophet stuck in a hole someplace with ravens feeding me than enjoying the delicacies of a queen and a king that are serving Baal because I know that Mount Carmel is about ready to happen there is as we say in the Ozarks somebody's getting ready to get their comeuppance that there that that pendulum we're, guys what we're at is we're at a time where it has been 90% grace and 10% justice to the place where we have people in the pulpit that think they can get away with anything. The world thinks they can get away with anything. There was a time in America that the government feared the church because they know bad things would happen by the hand of God if they didn't. Now there is no fear of the church. They believe that they can regulate the church and control the church and try to silence the voice of the church. But what's getting ready to happen is that pendulum is beginning ready to swing, and in the next couple of years, we're going to start seeing it. It's, it's not going to go shook. <laughs> it's going to slowly go like this. And we're going to see that it, it gets to where it's 70% grace and 30% justice, and then 60% then grace and 40% justice. And it's going to swing just as high as it went up this way. It's getting ready to swing back up this other way to where it's going to be 10% grace and 90% justice. And you know who's going to stay under the grace? Was the remnant that stayed faithful when it was back up 90 and 10 this way. I want to look at some things because we need to understand how God deals with things. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is just a test. It's final exam time. And another parable put he forth unto them. Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 24. So this is a parable. The kingdom of heaven, so this is how the kingdom operates. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in, the earth, in, the, in his field, and the field always in Jesus' parables represents the earth. I think Jesus is the good man. He put forth good seed in the earth. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and he went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not uh, sow good seed into, the, into thy field? From whence hath then it tares? And he said, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go up and gather them up? Lord, shouldn't judgment fall on these things right now? They're, this, 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 they're beginning to manifest who they are. Should, that, should not we go and judge these things now? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Let both grow together until we see who's really who. Now, what we have failed to realize because we've had such hyper grace taught for such a long time is that everything in the kingdom operates in a court of law. That did not change with the cross. That court of law 
allowed all of the judgment to come on Jesus for those who would come under his provision so that they could have 100% grace and zero justice as far as heaven is concerned. If you did away with the court, that would do away with your salvation. It would also do away with the very legal ramifications that God set into place through the writings of Moses. God began to systematically establish his law in the earth so it would match the way it is in heaven so that when God did something in the earth, it would affect heaven and earth together. That's what the cross did. And it's still established. Do you guys see that? Okay. So we, we, have, we have in, because I think the, the, uh, the field represents the church and it also represents the earth, that the devil has been growing up his crowd in and out of the church the same way that God has been growing up his wheat in the earth. And how they're mature, did you know that literally tear and wheat look identical until harvest time? You can't tell the difference. Except for one, when harvest time, wheat bears fruit that, that the kernels fill with, with real stuff. And it causes, if you ever look at a wheat field when it's ready for harvest, it's because the heads of the wheat are bowed down like this, of the weight of the fruit. Tear, they're just a bunch of airheads. There's, no, there's nothing in those kernels. They're, they're puffy air. And so they stand up in pride and stand erect in the last days. And what that tells us is pride and humility before God are what separate the tare from the wheat. And so whenever there is a harvest coming, both have got to be identified. And the, the wheat need to realize that God suffered the tare because God will never bring anything before his judgment bar before the time. We see that when God was talking with Abram, he says, now, he said, I I'm going to deal with the Amalekites, but their iniquity is not full. They have not been fully matured. And there's a lot of things in the earth that God has had to wait not only for the tear to mature so that he could judge them, but for the saints to mature so he could bless them. Because we see, and I think it's in Isaiah 60, where it talks about the gross darkness covers the earth. God says, your light has come. The tares have done all this, but the wheat is getting ready to have a harvest come in. I'm trying to connect a lot of dots for you. We, Mary and I, we've been discussing that we've not really seen the power of God the way that we would like in America. But they're seeing it in Africa. But you know Why? Because radical Islam is a darkness that is covering Africa. And so in, the, in that area, God is saying, well, you know what? If it gets that black, I want to make that much light. There was a man on Sid Roth this week, and I, I told Mary, I said, this guy is so real and just so happy. I mean, all he has to do is, uh, he, he, he was preaching, and they were praying, and he just started praising God, right? Middle. I don't care if it's taking up airtime. I just got to praise the Lord. And he, he was just so real. And they were, they were sharing a situation that his cousin was out preaching the gospel, and radical Islamic militants killed him over it. Do you know what this man's response was? As soon as he could get back down there, he held a revival. 2,000 people showed up. There were one, huh? 4,000. That's right, 4,000 people showed up. 2,000 of them got saved. There were people coming out of Islam. So when gross darkness covers the earth, your light can shine. We got gray in America. We don't have darkness. We got gray because the church is so compromised with the world, there's no distinction. But let me tell you something. The darkness is going to come on America too, but that's when your light's going to shine. Because I, if, if I have stood in God's ways now when there seems to be no benefit, when this pendulum swings back the other way fully, and it's just now starting just to, to kind of go this way in America, when it comes back and there's 90% judgment falling in America, I'll be under the 10% grace because I was faithful over here. We need to realize that what I do now affects my later. And even, it, and guys, this is what, because I've been, I've, been, I've been, like I've been in New York and other places teaching this stuff, and you, and you do out a scripture where uh, dealing with Saul, well, couldn't Saul repent? Couldn't have Saul repented. 
No, it's too late. It cost him because he already did it. He already set it in motion. That's like saying, could Esau repent? He tried and there was no place found for him for repentance because he set some things in motion that when he saw the trouble coming, it was too late. You see, there is benefit to righteousness. And when the king is in the field, he came down and he blessed Abraham at the same time he was going to see what was going on with Sodom and Gomorrah. We look at God cursing the Tower of Babel, and he did that for the sake of the righteous because the devil was trying to bring about tribulation and the book of Revelation before we even got to the book of Matthew. We weren't even out of the book of Genesis yet. We didn't even get to Exodus. And he's trying to bring about the end before the beginning. And so when, when the devil tries to take things out of God's timing, God says, you know what? I'm going to judge this for the sake of the righteous because I've still, I've still got to call Abram. I've, I've, still got to, I've still got to take care of Pharaoh. I've still got to raise up Elijah and Elijah, and I've got to raise up King David, and, and then I've got to come, and there's going to be a whole, there's going to be a virgin born. And because of that, I confused their languages and let them be scattered abroad so that I could get to the cross and then to get to the book of Acts and then to let Paul write his stuff so that we could get to where we are today. It was God's grace that judged and what we're finding out today is they're rebuilding the Tower of Babel in the lives of people and what we forget is Islam had its birthplace in Babylon it's just another side of the coin it's a little bit different but let me if you ever read Islamic writings the God of Islam does not show the same character of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's more like Mars, the God of war. Different God. Verse 3 says, Let both grow up together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye up first the tares. Now here's the thing about the placement of the rapture. We're always taught we're going to get out of here first. Jesus said the tares were going to be taken care of before the wheat was gathered up. Who's right? Jesus? Or all of our interpretation of some things the Apostle Paul took, and we actually used the separation of verses and chapters to make our argument when they didn't exist in Paul's writing. Because if you actually look at it in the original Greek, you have the rapture of the church is directly connected to the valley of Armageddon, the day of the Lord. It's just one paragraph, not ten, not 10 verses and a chapter difference. We put those in there, not the Apostle Paul. Our flesh has separated things out. We may have to go through something, but let me tell you something. The wheat is allowed to stand so that the tares can be judged. You need to let that sink in a little bit because some of us have had some tares in our lives that won't bow before God. They're about ready to get plucked. To stay reverent before God. Let your fruit be seen. And let your fruit, your fruit, true spiritual fruit does not cause you to be lifted up in pride. It causes you to humble yourself before a living and holy God. That's why this week when, when I did this report, you know, you, you just, you're just kind of doing things in the kingdom. And you don't really, God says, go back and count the beans, boy. <laughs> And I did, and I was sitting there trembling at my desk, guys. Because I couldn't believe what God had done. And it, it didn't come, oh, look what Mike Lake's done. It's like, look what God has done in spite of Mike Lake. Look what he's done. Look at the, the lives that we've touched, that he's touched through us. I didn't know I had that many books to give away. Or many, as many, but when, when you begin to look at it and, and that and all, it's like when you put it all together, we have literally become the five loaves and the two fish and never even realized it. And that we're affecting that many people and what that caused you to do. I was sitting there at my desk trembling and, and tears were running down my face because I was at awe of God. Sometimes even with the suppers here, I'm at awe of God because, guys, I swear that most of you carry out more food to take home than mama brought in here. It's like the crock pot that won't quit. 
or the we just kept eating brisket and eating brisket at one of the feast celebrations, and we brought in three pounds, but everybody carried out 10 pounds worth of brisket when they went home. When you calculate it all together, you stand amazed because God just blesses. Nobody ever leaves one of these things hungry, do they? No, it's go get the two-wheeler. I'm going to need help getting to the car. And then and that there's, and we, we, we get, if you're walking with God, you begin to see that in little ways. You go longer without a car breaking down. You go, the gas goes longer. The, the, you're healthier longer. You're, all these things, God just begins to bless. And sometimes they're so subtle that you don't really realize it. And then you go back and you, and you, begin, you begin looking at your bills and you look at how much you brought in and the bills got paid and you still had food to eat. But sometimes when you look at your checkbook that your bills were greater than what you put into your checkbook, but you still... Anybody else ever been there besides preachers? You look at it, and then you, you look at that, and, and God still gave you the grace that you're able to go and buy extra stuff sometimes at the store that you, you, you set and you take, you take uh, uh, inventory of the other junk that you bought that really wasn't necessary that God allowed you to bring. And when you, you look at all that and you say, how did I do that? How did I do that? It was the subtle blessing of God. We're getting ready to come into a time, guys. I'm, I'm here. To, I'm giving you a prophetic word that we're getting ready to enter into a time. It's no longer going to be subtle. It's going to be accentuated based upon your faithfulness when you couldn't even tell there was blessing. Because if the pendulum went this far this way, the universe has got to be balanced and God's getting ready to bring it back this way. That's why when gross darkness covers the earth, God says, your light has come like a no other generation and nations will run to the brightness of your glory. Because you chose to stay white or light when everything was gray and darkness began to take over, God says, devil turns up the volume, I'm getting ready to turn up the volume because both of you have matured. The tares get that level of darkness because they have matured. And we're getting ready to see those in ministry that are tares. It's no longer going to be gray. We're going to see the darkness of what they have done. And true believers are going to run from them like they're fleeing Sodom and Gomorrah like Lot before God judges it. And it's going to be obvious when this all said, is said and done who's walking with God and who isn't. God is not going to allow the gray to continue. The dark is going to get darker and the light is going to get lighter. Guys, we need to understand that this, this, this time, did you know in the charismatic movement, I, I was at the beginnings of the charismatic movement, healings were common. People getting baptized in the Holy Spirit was common. All these things was common. And what God did is God, in it, to, to show himself, he stepped back. That's why the Bible says that it, you're blessed who, who is blessed? Those who believe God is and diligently seek him, that you seek him when there's, when there's nothing going on, that you're still seeking him when you don't see anything going on. How many are going to run after, the, after the, the prophets of Baal because God's not speaking right now and they got to have a word? I've had members of my own congregation in the past that lost something, that prayed and God didn't answer, so they called a 1-800 psychic line. And I'm thinking, are you nuts? Call the devil because God didn't answer you fast enough. That same individual said, you know what? When you pray to the devil, you get things a whole lot quicker. Yeah, because he's wanting to pile it up on you as he pushes you off into hell. And then the rest of them, well, I prayed and I prayed and I didn't get nothing. I didn't hear nothing. If you're faithful in little, you shall be faithful over much. We're getting ready to see the volume turned up both in darkness and in light. Which side have you been dancing on here lately? Where, where, where have you built your life? Is it on the rock or is it on the sand? Because the pendulum is going to begin swinging this way. We've, I've, I've had guys... Mary and I have had to cast a Holy Ghost out of people because what they got baptized in was not the Holy Spirit. It was another spirit they've gotten in churches. I mean, when they would pray in tongues, it was just like, not, just like fingers on a chalkboard. 
And if the, if the Holy Spirit ever begins moving through you, it actually will heat up your body. And I had one man one day that whenever he prayed, it was just like nails on a chalkboard. He said, let me show you what the anointing does to me. And he grabbed me, and it was like death just took a hold of me. I mean, refrigerator, death. And so our response was we cast that thing out of him and got him baptized in the right Holy Ghost. How many churches are like that right now? Or here's how you all pray. This is, all, this is how you all get the Holy Ghost. Repeat after me. Rondai, Shandai, Pastor Rodhouse is going to get a Hondai. Now you're No, you're not. It comes up out of your spirit. Nobody has to teach you. And oh, by the way, he is getting a Hyundai, by the way. I just had to throw that one in there. But the devil made look for bad. God's getting ready to do for good. But we need to understand the tide is getting ready to turn. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. All the years that you were faithful, it seemed like evil prospered. God's getting ready to balance the scales of justice and grace on your behalf. The king is in the field. I don't have to run from the king because I've been bad. I can run to the king because I've been good. And I can fellowship with him. I can worship him. And then the king can see my enemies and say to stand there, son, let me go ahead and take care of him. Since I'm down here and I'm visiting, I'm going to go ahead and take care of some things. I got some muff comeuppance to give out. Uh, they, they, they've, got, they've got a balance due from the kingdom of God, and it's a negative balance, but they're about ready to reap what they have sown. That's why the Bible says, don't be weary in well-doing, because what you reap, you shall also, or what you sow, you shall also reap. It may be a while to get to the harvest time, and you've got to work through the heat of summer where you've got to fight drought, and you've got to fight moles, and you've got to fight weeds, and you've got to fight all these things, and you would rather go sit in the house and not do anything and let somebody else do it. But God says, there comes a harvest time. There comes a time in the cool of the fall. There comes a time of refreshing. And although you, you sowed seeds in mourning, you're going to gather in your sheep with rejoicing that's the time we can I can rejoice with my sheaves there's gonna be a lot of other people that mourn and weep by reaping what they have sown that's where we're at prophetically you're gonna see it increase over the next couple of years but I, I want I, I like things to be balanced I like things to be balanced and it's going to slowly start moving and slowly start moving. But this, this is the biggest swing we've ever had. This really, in history, in history, this is the biggest swing up this way we ever had. When we get all the way up this way, it's called the tribulation period. And it's starting to move in that direction. We're in the last of the last of the last days. But you know what? If I was faithful here, he'll keep me here. Well, brother, like, when's the rapture going to happen? Exactly when God says it's going to happen. And I don't care if it happens the last three seconds of the tribulation period or two seconds before the tribulation starts. He is more than able to keep me because I've been faithful. And he is faithful. I've sowed seeds now that are going to help me reap the blessing and the protection in the days ahead. That's why rehearsing the feasts are so important. It prepares us. Just watch. Things are going to get darker while things get brighter for certain people all at the same time. Because the pendulum is starting to swing once again. Father God, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that your word does not return to you void, but it will accomplish whereunto you have sent it. And Father, I ask that this word today, that your spirit would just cause those on the internet and, and Father, those that, that get the message, Father, let it give hope. Let it give correction. Let it give inspiration, Father. Let it help your people connect the prophetic dots that they could be ready for the days ahead we ask. In Jesus' name.